I was among the first group of people who cleaned up. There was a lot of you know bones, you know, and skeletons, you know, um, all littered all around the main campus. He got shot. He said, "What are you saying? Do you have Ebola?" I said, "Maybe something like that, but I'm not too sure." Myself, but I want to go to my check out the ET. This is Liberia, Africa, a place of unbelievable poverty, where a senseless civil war raged for more than a decade. Liberia is where an unprecedented health crisis has killed thousands of people, Ebola. Today, with the help of compassionate organizations such as the Foundation for Women, fellow human beings are working tirelessly for all Liberians. This is not good. What about disease is this? We've never had anything so bad. And it's killing, you see, people are, it was terrible, very bad. And because of that, again, the women rise up. Say, we have to do something about this. Our children are dying, our husbands are dying. We have to do something. They started using uh, the plastic bag the black plastic bag as gloves because they have to improvise. When they see their children and sick, you have to touch. So they wear this plastic bag and tie it around their wrist just to care for their sick babies. Yeah. You're with small, huh? small work. So if we have, if you want to do that, you got to become the slogan during the Ebola crisis was all hands on deck. And my hope for my country is that we continue that spirit. We need all hands on deck. I would be more useful in my country than anywhere else. Everything about it is different from ordinary sickness. I mean, the pain, the discomfort, the diarrhea, the vomit. I mean, everything about it is just exceptional. There is nothing easy about it. So when I, when I had this severe pain, first it came with, with, with a joint pain. From there it came with chill. The next thing, I felt the same of malaria. 2014, you know, it became clear that Ebola was ravaging the country. It had started in Lofa, subsided initially, and then there was this one case that went to Sierra Leone for a funeral, came back through Foya, came to Monrovia, went to a congested neighborhood, and it just spread like wildfire. People like Deborah Lindholm, who now call Liberia home, are joining together with citizens, hand in hand, hug to hug, caring deeply for all, and doing the real work needed to gently bring Liberia back into the hands of its amazing, loving, and spirited people. For years, the Foundation for Women has been helping the families of Liberia with microfinancing, their work is making a huge difference in this country of four million people. Today, the Foundation for Women is providing microfinancing to low-fee independent schools, impacting the lives of tens of thousands of children. Liberia has the largest percentage of school-age children out of school of any country on the planet. The incredible resilience of Liberians can be heard through the countless voices of survivors who themselves persevere and work through exhaustion towards a better, more hopeful future. During the Ebola crisis, so many pulled together to find a way to not only survive, but get back to thriving in this beautiful country filled with beautiful people. 
A few of the most powerful voices can only be heard here. Liberians reminding us of the heartbreak and heartache of war and Ebola. Here is where people will tell you exactly what it took to take on this heartless disease and the catastrophe of civil strife. In the Ministry of Health, we have a group of, of technicians, which I'm a part, which developed this plan. And with the government, they have approved it. They have, we have the investment plan. And that investment plan is, is like, okay, this is the Bible now that we want to invest in the health system of Liberia. We need resources to do that. And uh, we, can't, we ask our partners to help us, and we will help ourselves so that the government's own uh, uh, internal revenue and budget is starting to do things plus what the partners are giving us. So putting all of that together, we hope that the surveillance and the preparedness become stronger, that we are able to trace diseases at the source before it gets so high and becomes so uncontrollable because our human resources for help and professionals are so few, we cannot cope. I, I went through my treatment. It was not easy going through treatment in an ETU where you saw two years old, two months old child die before your eyes. You saw father die before the eyes of the children. You saw mother dying before the eyes of... It was not something small. But in the midst of all of these things, I still had courage. Mm -hmm. I still had God up there. I was still hoping high until on this fearful day, because they did the first specimen, the second one, the virus was still active. The third one, when the guy come and said, Fully, you are going home today. I said, What? Am I going home today? He said, You are going home today. Your virus has, has ceased and it's okay. And I just sat down in the chair like I was done for that. And I couldn't just believe that. I came into that ETU where thousands of, I mean, hundreds of people died before my eye, and I'm walking out of there. So that alone brought joy and it brought tears to me. So when I called back home, I didn't know that my boss had not got the information. So he called me. He said, Fully, are you being discharged today? I said, yeah. He said, ah, nobody should come for you. My very self is going to come for you. And true to his word, he drove his car. He came and picked me up. And again, I went back to my family. But then when I got home, it was, it was disappointing. My home was, was being abandoned by friends. Nobody could pass, nobody could cross into my yard. Nobody wanted to be associated with my family. And they were just all by themselves. Stigmatized. Yes. So I look at myself, I say, it is because of me that my family are going through all of this trauma. What do I do? I started to talk to them. And thank God they did not reject me. They all showed me love. They all showed me love, although there were neighbors, there were community members that were still stigmatizing me. But my family embraced me. I mean, my family embraced me. We were all happy together. And I was just there. I started to seek the advice of other doctors because when I left, I left a lot of pain, my ear, my joint. I had dropping weight. There was no appetite. But my family, people calling me, praying with me, people encouraging me. Until I had to come to myself. Today, here I am. And the first doctor who died, I mean, healthy, strong doctor, you would not think he would die in the next 15 years. And then suddenly Ebola knocked him down and he was gone. Before we know what was happening, many nurses there, you know, it's, it's almost like a total of about 200 health workers in all died. Well, it was actually in the year 2003 that I could tell that war was around me. Because in 1996 and 1990, I was small, and my parents were the ones that had to bear that burden. But in 2003, I experienced the war because I heard the gunshots, saw dead bodies around. But I don't like to speak of that experience as being the worst because I was very opportune 
to be cared for by this amazing family, the Do's. And I always remember them when my siblings and I went to Ghana. So they made us to forget that what was in Liberia. The only pain and sorrow was the fact that we had our own family members and friends back home. We had our country back home that was being ravaged by war. I was still in grade school. I said, no, I'm, I'm a student. He said, no, I don't want to believe you. I can remember when we used to cross a swamp, that is across a river to your area, you'll go and call the government too, then they'll come and then they'll start shooting at us. For I said, no, you don't even know me. I don't know you. And he said he was going to kill me. So they made me scrape myself. I took off my entire clothes and they look at me. He said, okay, I'm not going to kill you, but I will break your legs. Then your mom can carry you. I said, then my, my mom started to cry. You don't have to break his leg, you don't have to kill him. He's not a fighter, he's not a soldier, he's not a rebel, nada. He's a student, he lived for me, and we are trying to flee from the war. And again, they shot up between my legs, and they did a whole lot of humiliating thing to me. Then, go first, and because of the, because of the society mind from my trap, and they said, oh, he's not a rebel. And I had, I would let go that day, and we walk from there until we enter Bangata. <laughs> They have traditional women, they have rural women, they have gender women. They all over the spread. They came here, they train up, they finance us. The voices of the people of Liberia deserve so deeply to be heard. Our fellow humans have endured so much, and we can learn so much from them. Deborah Lindholm the founder and CEO of Foundation for Women, along with so many other caring and compassionate members of this very important organization, continue their dedicated missions in Liberia. The experience was just very horrible. From the instant we landed on the other side of the bridge, there were bodies literally littered on the ground that you couldn't find space, you know, even as you were hopping over I mean, it reminds me of the massacre in Rwanda and how it's depicted mm -hmm. in, in Hotel Rwanda. Mm -hmm. You know, with how the guys were driving and bumping on so many bodies. Exact scenario. Only that this time, you know, you had to be hopping over bodies here and there until we got to Clara Town. You know, and then there were much less bodies and there was this, just troops of people moving towards Prince Johnson territories. So that day we finally got to Logan Town and, you know, it was difficult to move further because we hadn't eaten for like two weeks, so we were all, you know, so very hungry. Deborah, it's, every time I talked about it, it just make my heart bleed. I don't know. It was terrible. Terrible. Nobody, nobody should live through war. Even if it's the just cause, do not go to war. It's not worth it. It doesn't help anybody. Both sides of the story, nobody wins. So it's better to compromise, to discuss, to harmonize things, to solve problems together in developing countries as well as uh, developed countries. But since we are talking about our country here, Liberia, we went through a lot of challenges. And by that time, I was already qualified as a doctor. Mm. And my heart bled because I was working in the hospital and they, are, they were bringing wounded young teenagers from the war front, bleeding. Some of them with gunshot wounds, you know, they carry them for uh, uh, x-rays, they go to the surgery, some make it, some died. And there came a time the hospital cannot function any longer. They are working through real perils and dangerous health hazards to aid the Liberian people and help them overcome what no people should have to endure. Deborah and her foundation are in Liberia today, creating and delivering financing, personal compassion and caring, and more than anything, Deborah 
and the Foundation for Women are bringing the world hope. Thank you, Deborah Lindholm, and the Foundation for Women. The people of our planet are inspired by your work. Our hope is that through this film, Millions more will come to the aid of the people of Liberia and join Deborah and her team as they bring true hope into all of our hearts. Personally, I find hope in the fact that we don't have war. For me, that's the most important thing. We don't have war. In the absence of war, we are very sure that our fundamental right to life is being preserved, is being protected. And once we have life, there is hope that we can push our country forward. So for me as a person, I find hope in the fact that there is no hope. And around me, I don't see, I don't think we are going back to war, never. So that is where I find hope. And I also believe that my country finds hope in that. Because so many people died, so many destruction, till today, Liberia is struggling to recover from all of the destructions caused by the war. So I think our hope, is in the fact that we no longer have war and we are gradually getting there, getting education, health care, and getting the economy back to where it should be. So in the absence of war, we have hope. I still believe that all is not lost, that we defeated Ebola, that we went through a civil war that was, you know, very, very terrible. We survived those things as a country. I think that we can also get our development initiatives right. So I'm going to live one day at a time. You know, and as God spares my life, I will continue my resolution of 21 November 1990, that for as long as I live, is going to be to work towards the improvement of this country so that no one has to suffer any of those things that we've gone through. So that the next generation, so that my son, or his son, or his son's son, can live in a better country. All we have to do is put our hearts together, keep our head up high, and see how best we can live like Europe. Now it's no longer about us, but the generation of born. What, can, what kind of precedent, what kind of, what kind of benchmark can we set that when they come, they will pick up from that, giving them some, giving them some, 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 some sort of hope for the future. Okay, now indeed you can still make it, there is life. This is why your, your, your brothers, your sisters, your parents went through and they made it, you too can make it, we need to do that. And each day before I get out of bed, I have to pray and just, just thank God for keeping me alive and able to move and to do things. Therefore, I must be of help, of service to humanity because I've been so blessed myself. And because I've been so blessed, Deborah, I want to bless others. And again, you are just a fabulous person. That word fabulous I learned from you. And it just lifted me up, lifted up my spirit that I want to do more and more. Because you are doing more to help these women with microfinancing and helping them to be empowered to help themselves and not to be powerless, poor, pregnant, nothing. No. You can turn that around into a success story. So the strength comes from God and praying that I will be of service to humanity, starting from where I am.